now to meet with Kat Weiss and her mom, Carol Hardesty. And Kat's going to be uh, giving a talk. Still have that 80s lawn surrounded by mature non-native plants. Time to re-envision and sheet mulch to a new native garden. So this is the before photo of the Hardesty's back garden. And this is this garden now. So this garden was just planted in the fall of last year and uh, Kat designed it. And uh, Mrs. Hardesty is very lucky to have Kat as her daughter because Kat is such a beautiful designer. And this garden has these large flagstone uh, steps that wind through the garden and paths that go around it. Here's some seaside daisy. And here's the beautiful spice bush. And let me stop sharing and we'll go now to meet with Kat again. Kat, are you with us? Or I am. Mom? Is your mom gonna join us or is she watching? Oh, my mom is watching. Okay, yes. well, Carol, I've been wanting to have your garden on the tour for a long, long time. So I'm glad we got there. So, um, Let's see, shall we just like leap right into um, the video and then we can see sure. what come up? Okay, Jessica, let's go ahead. Let me stop sharing. Good morning. I'm Kat Weiss and I'd like to welcome you to my parents' garden, Don and Carol Hardesty in Livermore, California. And this was an existing garden originally planted in 1980. So the trees are uh, quite mature at this point in time. It had a very large lawn and my parents finally made the decision to take out the lawn and invite in a lot more wildlife. And since the transformation, my father can report that the bird life has just exploded. They also added two water features, this little guy here and a basalt fountain that you see in the distance there. We added boulders, paths, ginger vines, a little bit more flagstone paving, and all of this that you see in the middle right here was all lawn. We brought in about 350 plants to fill in some of the uh, side areas as well. And as you've all probably listened to Dr. Tellamy's talk by now, this is hopefully going to help the native populations of birds, butterflies, other little critters to feed our birds. And now I'm gonna take you on a little walk here. The garden has uh, several different ecosystems, little microsystems rather. There's some shady areas where we added some heuchera maxima. I'll show you a larger one of those soon. Uh, we added the Ribes vibernifolium, evergreen currant. We added some Erigerin glaucus white lights. We added Erigerin curvinskianus, the Santa Barbara daisy, which is pretty well known because it tolerates just about everything. Um, we also added both the white form and the blue form of the Douglas iris, Iris Douglasiana. And here's a close-up of the Heuchera maxima flowers. So cute. We have giant chain fern, Woodwardia fimbriata. Also in the shade, we have Mimulus orantiacus, sticky monkey flower. And around here, the sticky monkeys grow on the north slope. So they do get a bit of an afternoon shade. It can tolerate full sun out here, but um, I'm finding they really prefer to have a little bit more protection. We've also got some Mahonias. This one's kind of covered with some tree stuff and not quite in flower yet. Uh, also on the edge of the shade here we have the 
Heuchera sanguinea. This one is the Splendens variety. Uh, the Heuchera sanguinea native to the uh, southwestern area. There is a nine bark that we planted back in 2005, which is huge. And in the shade, you can see some more Mahonia. There are some Diamond Heights Cenothus. This is a lovely fountain. So to keep the uh, Nine Bark Company, some Mahonia. Diamond Heights, always fun to use and brighten up a little shady area with those bright chartreuse colors. These are Calistoga boulders, also called Willow Creek in some uh, nursery, uh, sorry, uh, landscape supply yards. That's a fun little oh, number. Look. Mike, look at your panel. It is a compressed eucalyptus yeah. panel that you can get to That's use wood. as decoration like I did, or you can also use it for uh, fencing. It comes in four by eight also. Um, here is the little Wayne Roderick Seaside Daisy just showing up for the party. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of an overview. This is a mound that we built from the old lawn. We've got our irises. We've got this radiant number, Penstemon heterophilus margarita bop, which has become very popular for those iridescent flowers. And this is our Calamagrostis foliosa, Mendocino reed grass, which you can see the canyon snow Douglas iris just beyond. Nice little drift of those. And uh, the Areogonum umbilatum, sulfur buckwheat. And the buckwheat's again, huge family of largely gray leaved plants that you can use in combination in any sunny spot. And then we have our Sphaerousia ambigua. This is one of the globe mallows. These are really fun. They come from the Southwest area. Sphaerousia incana is another. Sphaerousia monroeana. Fun to use because the color, it, it, um, it's quite variable. This one tends towards a like light pink salmon color. They can also be quite orange. And um, look at this guy. This is our Ceanotha Centennial. Tiny little leaves, which probably also could tell you that um, the deer aren't gonna like this guy very much because there's just not much meat on it. So if you go to your smaller leaf Ceanothuses, Dark Star, Julia Phelps, they will be a little bit more successful if you've got a deer issue. Here is a close up of our purple form Douglas Iris. And here's grandmother's cottage. little baby Boodalua, blue grandma grass. They'll come up with these super cute little mustache shaped flowers. And just popping up, the milkweeds. These of course are super important for our monarchs, habitat as well as feeding. So even though they turn into true perennials, dry up, leave them there until you can tell for sure if somebody has taken it as a home or not. We've got some ground cover manzanitas, little Massachusetts and Point Reyes. Grandmother's Cottage has some California fuchsia, which is a great one for late flowering into the summer. Red tubular flowers, hummingbirds love it. A little bit more dot irises in there. And behind us there's Another nine bark, Physocarpus capitatus. 
and uh, Symphoricarpus, our snowberry, native snowberry. Good for the, uh, the woodland edges, which is where they kind of like to be. They don't mind some sun, but they're sort of used to peeking out amongst the larger forested areas. There's our little Circus occidentalis, red bud. It's going to make a nice little pop of color in the very early season. And this is our native dogwood, Cornus sericea, Bailei. It's these beautiful little umbels of flowers and very red stems. And another fuchsia. It's going to look fabulous late summer. A little bailey eye there. Here's the garden from this angle. So even if you have existing plants that you've noticed aren't really providing as much food and habitat as you would like, you can always find a place and maybe you have a really big place that you can fit in. Some natives bring in the fun. We have a lot of native Dudleyas that love to be on a mound or in a pot. This is Dudleya pulverulenta. You can pair it with a boulder. They look really awesome. Dudleya palmary. You can try Dudleya farinosa, Dudleya candelabrum. They are starting to be more available in the trade. Just make sure it's a reputable source that you get it from. And here is our Ariagonum grande virubescens, little ruby buckwheat, another fabulous plant for low color, spring to summer. Thank you for joining me. Well, Kat, that was beautiful. So that garden was planted last fall, is that right? Yeah, and I almost thought about attempting yet another video um, like last week, because it's absolutely exploded in all dimensions um, and it looks pretty awesome. But, um, but yeah, that was planted in last fall. And when did you make that video then? You did it early. Um, it was early spring. So I want to say, where are we, May? I think it was probably sometime in, in mid-March or something. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, just a few months old then, four months old or something. Right. Mm -hmm. That looks fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, I think it looks great too. I, yeah. I do wish uh, you could see it now because it's even better. <laughs> Take, photos. Take some photos. Okay, I will. So when your mom has it on the tour again, we have a nice collection of photos. So I know your mom's been really happy with the garden and with the birds that it's attracted. She has been. And I would say it's one of these uh, COVID gardens where we did it, we were still in lockdown. And I, I think it probably saved both my parents' souls to just have something to focus on and get out there and play in the garden. Even though, you know, there's not a lot of care right now, it's still, you know, you, you can if you want. You can choose to deadhead or you can choose to putter around. So it's, it's been a good, good addition. So how did you, what did you do with the big lawn? How did you manage with the big lawn? Uh, we got some question about that. Yeah, the big lawn is still there and it's just under it all. So typically they had a mow strip. Um, so that was an easy fix to dig all the lawn up around the mow strip, maybe about 12 inches or so, and just dump that in a big pile. And then uh, we just added some more soil to that pile. Um, the lawn is under there somewhere. Um, I typically will add about six to eight inches of some decent garden mix, some loam that, that has some organic materials in it. Um, put that on top and just kind of, you know, walk around on it, stomp on it, water it a little bit um, and plant in that. Uh, when I was originally doing this, I was just attempting to plant right in the old sod. And that wasn't quite as successful because air pockets and chunks of sod are not the, the best to, to plant in. So I do add some soil to the top of it. Um, the succulent mound, is, it's actually got a third um, three-eighths inch lava rock mixed in there for some better drainage for the succulents. And so you can use like a third, a third, a third compost, loam, and 
the, um, the smaller lava pieces to mix in. And the reason that people should consider keeping their lawn, if they're gonna do any digging up of the edging anyway, on right. site is for drainage, is that right? Right, well, two things. So the one thing is um, the drainage. Um, almost all natives love to have their feet up just a little bit. Um, out here in the inland uh, nation, we are clay, clay, clay everywhere. So if you can just lift things up a little bit, it helps a lot. Um, but the other thing is that for many of our suburban gardens, they scraped it all clean when they built the house, stuck a lawn on it and called it a day. And so that lawn might be the only organic matter you have on that piece of soil with its root zone and its, and its leaves. So why not use it to compost and build some more soil underneath those layers? So it sounds like what you did is you just um, dug away like on the parking strip near the edge, is that right? Just to keep the lawn right. from continuing to grow up near that edge. Right, yep, you just dig away the edge because I also sheet mulch. So I add cardboard to most of my projects, this one included, to keep the moisture in, keep the weeds down, make it all um, nice and tidy. So when you have you know, a concrete edge, you want to come down with the lawn so the cardboard comes, then the mulch comes on top and you don't have it spilling over your paving. Well, when we started running our mulching workshops many, many years ago, you were the first workshop that we ran one with at Dixie Finley's Garden. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pictures of that. Well, Kat, that was beautiful. I loved seeing your new garden. I love seeing your mother's garden where you tell your mom, I've been thinking about her garden for many years and wanting to have Mrs. Hardesty's garden on the tour. So I'm finally <laughs> glad that we did. And when we get back to a live tour, hopefully next year, I hope you guys can both be on it as a mother-daughter duo. Yes, it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. Will you uh, stay on and answer any further questions sure. about on Zoom? So if you'd yep. like to see more of Kat's work, you can go to Find a Designer on the Garden Tours website. Look under Kat Weiss and you'll see a portfolio of her beautiful, beautiful gardens. And Kat, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been fun. <laughs>